Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my talk a little bit about you know what's been happening with Qt um, over the last year and what probably will happen with it, you know, let's say in the next one or two years going forward. Um, since you're all here, uh, I assume that you all know what Qt is. What Qt is, so I'll, I'll spare myself that introduction. Um, just as a side note for all of you who are, might be interested in having more detailed talks about what's happening in Qt. We're having a Cute World Summit coming up in Berlin, actually in exactly three weeks from now at the BCC Center. So if there are still tickets available, in case you're interested, you know, go to cute.io and you can register there for that one. Well, with that, let me get started and, and you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, as I said, what's happened over the last year in Cute. Some of the things, you know, maybe not quite, you know, directly related to C++. It's a little bit on a tangent here with, with this conference, but I hope I'll also have enough you know, C++ related content for you, as Qt is a C++ framework as its heart. As you probably all know, you know Qt is being developed as an open source uh, project uh, and out in the open. And you know, we're doing a lot of work there, um, seeing how things are going, and we're also seeing that we're really, you know, um, growing the ecosystem, the ecosystem, the number of Qt users are growing. It's the first time pretty much that we're showing these kind of down, download numbers that we have distilled now. So you can see that we're actually getting, you know, quite a lot of users, you know, Qt is being downloaded quite a lot of times and we have a nice growth, you know, over the years and we're currently this year, we're getting pretty close, we'll probably get pretty close to 5 million downloads. This is an estimate um, based on the first nine months of the year but we have one major release coming out in the next couple of weeks, and I think that will boost us quite a lot. Um, I think, you know, as said, you know, we're developing Qt as an open source project, so I'd also like to just, you know, have a quick thank you for everybody who has been contributing to Qt uh, with, you know, bug reports, uh, with patches, with, you know, con Con, um, being, you know, a member of the forums and other things, especially one thanks to our largest partner, KDAP here, who has been doing, you know, consistently over the last years, you know, being the largest external contributor outside of, you know, the Qt company, who is the company behind Qt, um, to the project. Okay, but let's, let's move a little bit on. I mean, we're growing the ecosystem. That's one of the things that we want to do. We want to make sure that Qt is being used in more places in the world. And one of the things we have been doing there is, you know, moving a little bit outside of the C++ ecosystem. But, you know, I'll actually show you a little bit, you know, something where you can see that for yourself. Python. Formidable. Agile. Here we see one in its natural setting. A marvel of evolution master of its domain. The Python developer is perfectly adapted to working with big data, automation tasks, artificial intelligence, and more. However, he lacks the ability to use advanced graphics and create complex user interfaces. Alone in the jungle, he will need a reliable partner. Oh look, it appears as if he has discovered something. Oh, of course, it's cute for Python. So this was a small video, you know, where, which we used to introduce cute for Python. This is something that we're bringing out right now. Um, the Python bindings have existed actually to, for, with Qt for quite a while. Um, both first with the PyQt, a commercial product, a small company, and then the PySite project. And we have been now building over the last couple of years on the PySite project, you know, creating bindings of Qt to Python, making sure that we bring that up to the latest versions of Qt that was for a long time Qt 4 based still, and that you also that we actually can support that fully. Um, so now with Qt 
with the Qt release that's coming now up, Qt 5.12 will also have Qt for Python as one thing that's fully supported. And you have the interoperability also with C++. So it's one way also of basically extending Qt for people who are more <laughs> adapted to scripting languages. We're basically supporting pretty much any, everything that's supported also on the C++ side uh, of Qt. Quick example, this is the Hello World in Python, Py, Qt for Python. You import, you know, as I said, you see the import, that's still PySite. You import the widgets, uh, and from there you import your application, your label, create an application, create a label, show it, and that's it. Very simple and very straightforward, and actually, you know, all of you have been developing in Qt will probably very much recognize that code. It's very similar to what we have on the C++ side. Um, but it doesn't stop there in terms of the ecosystem. There's another thing um, what we have. I mean, Qt has been, you know, all the years a cross-platform framework, and we wanted, want to make sure that we cover all major operating systems and platforms that are out there. For many years, actually, we've had a very, very large gap. There's one platform that, you know, everybody uses and we're not supporting. It's HTML5 and the web. And that's something we're fixing right now. We have now a version of Qt for WebAssembly. With WebAssembly, uh, we finally have the technology to bring Qt applications to the web. And that's something that we will be you now supporting as a first technology preview, coming also with Qt 5.12 in autumn. With that, you can compile any Qt application into a WebAssembly package, run it on a browser, and you know, have that kind of zero deployment solution. Um, Stack-wise, you know, this is how it basically looks. You have you know, HTML and the WebAssembly as the bottom you know, from the browser. We're using mscripten then to compile um, the C++ code down to something that can run in that one, putting Qt on top of that and your application on top of that one again. So you can build one once, you know, deploy everywhere. We're finally you know, having that also for the browser. There's no installation required, and you, of course, get the sandboxing security from the browser. Um, so t technology preview and the license will be GPL and, you know, the commercial license that you can get also from the Qt company. If you want to try it out, it's actually pretty simple. You know, you get the source, Qt source code um, either through the, through, our, through the installer or by pulling it from, uh, from, uh, from our code review, you know, or from GitHub, from the GitHub mirror. Configure it with minus cross-platform WebAssembly mscripten, build Qt, and then you have pretty much everything you need to get going. Of course, you need to install mscripten before that. We're supporting pretty much most of the modules that we have in Qt, you know, everything that's in the base module, declarative, and many other things. The main thing that's not supported currently is multimedia and, of course, web engine, because it doesn't really make sense to nest the browser inside a browser. And um, I was thought, thought, you know, it's maybe good if we can have a small demo on that one. So let's see if I can get that working here. Um, I'll need to... Just one second. So let's see if I can get this out, out of this one here. Yep, and here we go. This is running inside Safari right now. Um, but it does also run inside any other modern browser, Edge, um, Chromium, Firefox. And those are three of our standard Qt demos. One of them, simple OpenGL-based demo, where we use OpenGL inside Qt. The widgets, Wiggly example, and the QML-based, um, you know, clocks example. Shows that all of three of those run, and run actually pretty nicely inside the browser. Um, um, so, I mean, CPU usage and everything is pretty reasonable in that area. So, cool thing to try and, and something you can, where you can really then compile things down, you know, create a package, put it on a web server, and you have your Qt application, you know, available to all of, to your users through that one. Also, a great, play, great way to demo your stuff. Okay, let's get back. Um, the third dimension of how we're trying to expand things a little bit is looking at, you know, other um, users than developers. 
we've seen that you know the requirements for you know high quality user interfaces have gone up over the last years. I mean people are users are expecting quite a lot more than they did a couple of years ago, just coming from the experience that they get, for example, from their mobile phones and tablets. And we've seen that it's always been very, very difficult for designers and developers to work together. Um, basically, have the a look. The working relationship between designers and developers can be complex. It's as if they speak different languages. A developer communicates in C++, Python, and other programming languages, while a designer communicates in wireframes, mockups, and sketches. Their visions are different. Ideas and prototypes go back and forth, wasting time and money. This workflow is simply not efficient. But there is a way for designers and developers to speak the same language. Qt is a cross-platform software development framework. Okay, so now that's the tagline. <laughs> what have we actually done? Um, and don't worry, by the way, I'll get to C++ as well. Um, so we've, over the last two years, we've created two tools. Um, one of them uh, for specially targeted for designers. One of them is Qt 3D Studio, which we have been releasing in the first version around a year ago. It's a 3D design tool uh, and a scene editing tool that helps you create 3D-based user interfaces. And we've done a lot of work now moving that forward. We're currently at version 2.1. 2.2 is coming out before Christmas, um, where we actually, you know, Design Studio was something that, whoa, no, that's interesting, is something that we got as a large contribution from NVIDIA. It was a tool that NVIDIA had developed, and it took us time to integrate that into Qt. With version 2, we basically brought it over based the runtime on top of our Qt 3D technology, um, integrated that with our 3D stack, you know, made sure that we, and now with the new versions, make sure that we use our text rendering to get you know, full Unicode support, something that the first version didn't support, and in improve also the integration with, our, with Qt Quick as a 2D UI technology and other things. So that's coming, uh, will be out uh, around, you know, before Christmas, the next version with 2.2. Um, this is basically a screenshot of how it looks. Um, so you can see here, you know, it's a design tool on the desktop. You have, you know, you can, for example, here a car dashboard that you design with 3D effects. Um, you, you can define light sources. You have a timeline editor to define an animations and timelines. The slides thing to dis define different states. And then you can immediately test that also on some, on the embedded hardware, for example, or the target device that you're targeting. Whether, you know, target device could also be the desktop, of course. But, you know, that is very nicely integrated and allows the designer to really test out their designs wherever they want to deploy it, make sure it works very nicely. So that's for 3D user interfaces. But traditionally, Qt has been more around 2D user interfaces. We've had, you know, Qt, Qt, QML, Qt Quick as one of the technologies there to do, create touch-based, you know, user interfaces with animations, um, these kind of things. And we've just released um, two weeks ago our first version of what we call Qt Design Studio. Um, it's a brand new tool that basically has been designed from the ground up to, with the user interface designers and, and in mind. But we've been basing that one on the Qt Creator application framework. So, you know, it integrates with Qt Creator. As a developer, you can use it just as well and integrate that and use it together with also all your code editing. It's an extension, you know, and it's building up from the Qt Quick Designer we had in the past, and, but has gotten a lot of new features. Let's have a look at some of them. And that's the final video. So with it, you can now export designs from Photoshop. So this is Photoshop. You can take stuff there, export it, then import that one into the, into the Qt Design Studio, create componentize it, create components out of it, use them then, hook up, you know, this thing to the application logic and to the different states to the logic, um, have a timeline editor also here for creating animations graphically, um, then also have a look at the code side by side with your, um, with your graphics add some effects that you need, 
and then preview all of that also in real time as you change things. So that's Qt Design Studio. So much for things we've been doing, you know, outside of the, you know, our main target audience, the creators, uh, the, the developers. Let's move over to that one a little bit more. And I'll start also here with the tooling a little bit. Qt Creator. Then done, been doing quite a bit of work, you know, on bringing our IDE forward. Um, we're making much more use of, of CLang now for, for, <coughs> for many things inside there. We've been, you know, Qt Creator had for a long time its own code, code model that was limited to C++ 98. You know, of course, we want to, you know, have that, you know, support everything that, um, that modern C++ supports, C++, you know. So we've been bring, bringing it over and using Clang now as our, for our code model and something that we had been in the making for a long time. It's been optionally there for two years now. We've now finally got the performance also to be really, really good enough and, you know, have moved over to make that def our default code, default code model. We've been doing work on Clang Tidy uh, um, integration, um, Clazy as well, and uh, some, some, to some extent Clang Modernize. And we're working on automatic co code form formatting also using Clang Format. So that's a lot of work that's ongoing. So, um, the code formatting will hopefully end up uh, you know, in the next or maybe one release later. We've done now for the next version that's coming up, um, uh, the upcoming version of Qt Creator. You can already get the beta, by the way. Um, ooh, stay here. We also have support now for multi-application debugging. So you can actually, inside Qt Creator, start several applications, connect both of them to the debugger, and debug them simultaneously inside one instance of Qt Creator. Which brings you quite a bit of a step further also to you know, for being able to do whole system debugging. Support for CPP stack check as a static analyzer has come in, and we've implemented support for, for the language server protocol. So that really gives you also nice um, support for other programming languages built in. And we're using that actually for Qt for Python to get the Python code model. Now, I know not everybody is using Qt Creator. We also have quite a few people using Visual Studio together with Qt. And we've been doing quite a lot of work there also to improve that integration that we have. Um, one of the main new features we have now is, is much, much improved QML and Qt Quick support. Um, we can now, in Visual Studio, basically oh God, um, lo look at QML, you know, you get code completion, um, also through the language server protocol. Um, you can debug things there, you can set breakpoints in QML, run it. Um, all of that works now with the built-in QML and JavaScript. So that also should make you know, that kind of, uh, you know, working with QML and Qt Quick much, much easier in Visual Studio. And then f finally, we have our next um, release coming up, Qt 5.12. That one is planned, we have the beta 3 out. We hope that we'll have the final uh, around the end of November, end of this month. Let's see, uh, and it's going to be a long-term supported release again, so we'll have something that's really supported for three years to come. Um, so, you know, apart from the usual things that we've been doing, what, what has happened with that release? I mean, usual things, making sure it works on new, new operating system versions, these kind of things. Um, let's have a look. I mean, one of the things has been bug fixing and quality. We have, since Qt 5.6, We've been fixing more than 5,000 bucks in, um, for, towards Qt 5.12. Since Qt 5.9, it's been more than 2,000 bucks still. And a lot of commit, lots of new functionality also that went in, which shows you that you know, things are moving. We're moving actually you know, pretty fast in many ways. So you know, if you're still on the old version of Qt, you know, consider upgrading. Also, Qt 5.6 will run out of support in, in a couple of months from now in, in March. We've done a lot of work towards Unicode. Um, with Qt um, 5.11 still, you have our Unicode support was, you know, a bit old. Well, actually, with 5.10, 5.9, we've done some upgrades to 5.11. Um, but it was basically Unicode 6-ish, and some stuff was, was even older versions. Um, with uh, 5.12, we've upgraded everything fully up to Unicode 10, 
will hopefully still do an upgrade to Unicode 11 um, within the 512 lifetime. So we've updated everything. They're all text-related algorithms, the bidirectional text handling for Arabic and Hebrew um, and right-to-left languages, the Unicode property data, um, text-breaking boundary algorithms, all of those things um, have been you know, updated. We've made sure that Q-regular expression also can handle Unicode better. We've done some updates there. Um, introduced also over, since five, Q59 string view and, and extended Q-Latin 1 string to handle more things there. So with that, you really get everything that you should need in, in terms of internationalization, much more up-to-date. Another nice new feature in Qt 5.12, um, we have support for CBOL, the concise, concise binary object representation. And it's, it's something that's also written down and encoded in an RFC. It's basically JSON on steroids um, in a binary format. So it has um, support for you know, J everything that JSON supports, plus a lot more data types. It's, it's actually typed, uh, has more types that you can use in there. And it's actually pretty easy to work with. You can extend it with your own types. Um, and the API that we have is very similar to what we have uh, as, a, as the API for, for parsing and, and modifying JSON. So yeah, you can create a QCBO map and you know, put in you know, sub-objects. You, know, you have an array for arrays. Um, so you see all of that works. And it's pretty nice and easy to work with. I can ha recommend having a look at that. Probably, if you're using JSON, this might be something that you want to look at, whether that makes more sense. Done work on our containers a little bit. Um, Byte array and string have gotten is upper and is lower functionality. Um, we have case-sensitive comparing now in Byte array, something that was just missing. Um, explicitly shared data pointer can compare with null pointers, and um, Q-regular expression actually gains support for wildcat matching. That's a nice new feature. And it's actually also going towards the way that we want to, in the long term, deprecate the old QRegEx class. On the networking side, um, we've done lots of work to implement DTLS support. Um, we've added a password digester class, which allows you to really you know, get a digest for, for any password out. Um, support for PKCS8. CS8. Uh, keys, um, and we have also ALPN, application layer protocol negotiation uh, support now on, uh, on Mac and iOS, which is uh, needed for HTTP2 support, for example. And finally, last but not least, we're also supporting OpenSSL 1.1.1 now in Qt. On the graphics side, um, we have uh, now support for 16.4. Um, 64-bit image formats um, available, um, so with uh, basically four shorts for, for the RGBA channels, compatible with what OpenGL has. And you can read and write them from TIFF, PNG files, grab them from OpenGL. Very nice uh, there. Um, longer term, we for the future, we're also looking into int introducing float-based image formats, um, but that's coming. We have web gradient support, so that's a lot of predefined gradients that you can just use for drawing. It's very nice uh, because you get nice and good looking gradients. This is so annoying. Um, and um, we have upcoming in after 5.12, hopefully a part of mo good part of it will make it into 5.13, support for color spaces in QImage, QPixMap, and QPainter. On the Qt widget side, we've been doing more work lately, you know, a lot of bug fixes, um, actively maintaining that now inside the Qt company. Um, some smaller API additions, but nothing really big, as widget seems is mostly feature complete, and, and we have rather few feature requests in that area. But we've rewritten the accessibility support on, on Windows completely, moving over to Windows UI automation, so you'll get much better and much improved accessibility. And we've done a lot of work uh, for printing on Linux uh, as well. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. Then the other UI technology, QML and Qt Quick. We've done actually a lot of work there over the last year. First of all, um, Qt Quick, as you probably know, also you know, 
you can use JavaScript within Qt Quick, and we have full JavaScript support for that. That was limited to ECMAScript 5 all the way until the last version. But with Qt 5.12, uh, we now have full ECMAScript 7 support. We, so we did a huge step up towards uh, modern uh, JavaScript. We have a support for what we call the input handlers now, which is a new way how you want to handle how you can handle input. Before it was usually through mouse areas and touch areas. Now you can attach input handlers to any item in Qt Quick. We have a shapes plugin which allows you to draw arbitrary shapes um, and paths on the GPU and in insert that into the scene graph. And we have actions and menus on the Qt Quick controls, so something that really helps on the desktop sites. And then we've done a lot of work to improve uh, performance and reduce memory consumption. I'll just show you two quick examples. You now we have a benchmark called QML Bench, which measures the overall speed of it. And you can see that we've done quite some work there. And it's, it's improvement is not as not very big between 5.9 and 5.12, but we have gotten other improvements there in terms of startup and reduced memory usage um, in addition. And if you look on the JavaScript side there, you see a larger difference. I mean, 5.6 and 5.9 are very equal on, on, uh, on Intel, 64-bit hardware. We've done a good step forward here. On uh, ARM64, you have a big difference, you know, moving up, but that is mainly because we enabled a jitting uh, between, you know, 5.6 and 5.9. But then we're also seeing some improvements here, and we believe we can do more in the future. <coughs> Cute location. We actually added more stuff there as well. We have an experimental navigation API, and we'd really love to get some feedback on that one. Um, we have some better support for Mapbox as one of the backends for, for location. And this is actually done you know, with the navigation API and Mapbox. So you see that there's, that's one of the examples there. Routes and places APIs are now extensible, so you can add, you know, easily incrementally add your own data well, and small, small thing QNX support. Um, then, you know, web engine. So, as I said, lots of new modules. I mean, this is mainly a lot of the work in Web Engine is really keeping up with what's happening out in the Chromium project. And Web Engine is based on Chromium, wraps Chromium, and provides you with a C and Qt Quick API to use that. We're now at Chromium 69. Um, we're exposing Web Actions, for example, now, and we have support for client SSL certificate as long as the operating system supports them. I have to probably put in that disclaimer. But lots of good things happening there as well. But as I said, a lot of the work is really just keeping up with whatever happens with Chromium. And you know, most of the new functionality of Chromium you then get for free in addition. For all of you who are doing embedded devices and not working on the desktop, we have that cute virtual keyboard. And that one now has gotten a lot of improvements. We've added 20 more new languages since 5.9. Handwriting recognition for more than 10 languages. And we added now um, in 5.12 a public API that you can use to write your own keyboard, something that wasn't easily possible before. So that's very good and, and very helpful if you need a specialized keyboard for special use cases. We have done also, you know, one of the things we've been focusing a little bit also is in the uh, is looking at the automation space and what people are needing, the, what the requirements there are there, and a lot of the work there has been going into you know machine to machine protocol support, you know. So we've upgraded MQTT and KNX our MQTT and KNX support that we've been having for two or three versions already, and we're adding also support for OPC UA, which is rather big also, especially here in Europe and in Germany, as a protocol to, to, to talk, for machines to talk with each other. Another thing that you know, many of our users on the embedded side need is, is something where they have a, actually a mission-critical system, like you know, a medical device, and certain things, pieces of functionality need to always work. Uh, and you need to be able to certify that piece of, of hard software and hardware together. 
And for that, we've been working over the last years on the, what we call the Qt Safe Renderer. You know, something where you can actually, you know, basically move critical parts of your user interface out into a separate, you know, process. That one's implemented using a much more restricted set of C++ in Misra C++. And it's actually, we got this, this summer certified to SIL3 and ACLD. And this one's not working anymore, sorry. <laughs> and it can run on, you know, pretty much any certified operating system. Interestingly enough here is also that we have done a tooling integration. So you can create your user interface in the Qt Quick Designer, for example, and with QML, and you should just mark the elements that are safety critical uh, as such. And then, you know, the tooling will pull them out and put them into a se that separate safe renderer process and render them through that one instead of the main user interface. By that, you can separate, you know, your areas of concern and most of your functionality, the one that's not you know, safety critical, you can just implement without having to worry about, you know, certification problems. And then we've done another thing is um, we have provi been providing a cute WebGL backend, basically uh, something that like, you know, for Windows or for Mac or Linux, we have a platform plugin which basically streams, you know, the cute application out through, over WebGL into a browser. So the application runs on a device and this is very, really interesting for the case where you have a, let's say, a, a headless device that you, put, that you have somewhere running, for example, in a factory, in an automation line, or some other places. And, you know, you want to go there with, a, with a, for example, a tablet. You have that both in the local network, and then you can basically stream the user interface over to your tablet uh, and into a browser. And, of course, the user input, input goes back. So it's, it's basically another way of, of you know, streaming the user interface. So these are the things that have been happening around uh, now towards Qt 5.12. And um, as said, we hope that 5.12 will be out by the end of this month. So with that, let's go a little bit into the future and have an outlook of what's, what's happening. What are, we what, what are some of the plans moving forward and, and you know, um, what are we what do I believe we're going to do over the future? I mean, since as Qt is an open source project, I will not know everything. You know, people will come up with other ideas, but this is some of the things I'm be, I've been thinking about that I know are happening. And um, I'd also be, you know, very happy, you know, if you have any ideas, any wishes for the future, let me know. But we'll get to that in a minute. First thing that you know, we're working on inside the Qt company is seeing how, can, how far down can we actually scale Qt. And we've been doing some work now to bring it down to microcontrollers. So hardware without a memory management unit. You know, Cortex-M7 is what we currently have running. And we're still you know, quite a bit above of the built-in RAM and ROM sizes. So you will need external RAM and external ROM for the moment. But we're getting down in size and we have you know, depending on the type of application, something running is in 3 to 10 megabytes of RAM and 6 to 13 megabytes of ROM. And that includes everything. That includes the operating system or, you know, and, and the, the Qt frameworks and the application. The, t the upper side is for something that's more like, you know, a small, we had said an e-bike demo where, you, you know, you have the user interface for an electrical bike, something like that. And we're seeing how we can get that further down and, you know, depending on interest, we'll, we'll do more work on the, in this area. And then the next big thing, we've started working towards the next major version of Qt. Well, actually, we haven't started doing work that much as we've started thinking about it. Um, you know, what do we want to do with Qt 6? We have sort of a tentative idea of when we want to do it, meaning in basically in around two years from now. And, 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 you know, we're starting to collect ideas what we want to do in that version. There's so a couple of things that are already getting clear, lots of other things that are still very much in the open. And as I said, I mean, if you have ideas for that one, please let me know, give me feedback, either now, uh, after the session, or maybe in the Qt meetup that's ha happening uh, in the hour afterwards. But there's also a couple of things we don't want to do. First one thing we don't want to do is break source compatibility. Well, and now I'm lying a little bit, not break it to the largest extent. 
Um, we want to, you know, of course we need to modernize Qt from time to time, you know. If we want to keep it relevant for the next years to come, you know, we need to look at what has changed in the world around us. You know, how can we adapt better to that world and what kind of things do we want to do there? But, you know, I know that there's also billions of lines of code written, you know, using Qt out there in the world. And we want to make it as easy as possible for all of you to move your code base over to Qt 6. So yeah, we want, don't want to break source compatibility where we can avoid it. But having said that, as one thing that we will do, we will remove deprecated APIs. We just have to. We need to you know, keep the code size maintainable so, uh, and things maintainable for us developing Qt forward in the long term. And that means we sometimes also need to cut out certain things. But the goal is that uh, we have you know, everything that we mark as deprecated in the last Qt 5 version only those things we will remove in Qt 6. So whatever you have you know, in Qt 5 um, as marked as deprecated, those are the things you will need to probably fix before you can move over to Qt 6. I want to somehow see, and this is you know, relevant for, you know, since I'm here at the C++ conference, see how can we actually integrate a bit better with standard C++. You know, it's a common complaint I'm getting that, you know, saying, oh, Qt feels a little bit like its own world and it's not very well connected to you know, whatever's happening on the standard side uh, in the standards with the standard committee, uh, standard C++ evolution. And one of my wishes there is that we try to you know, see how we can bring things closer together. The, the difference there is there for many good reasons, for historical reasons, partially. You know, when we started out with Qt and, and the containers, there, wasn't any, there weren't good alternatives existing in the standard space. You know, the standard, you, as you know, I mean, between 2000 and 2011, nothing was happening with the standard. So we had to invent our own things. So lots of those are reasons why we have things, um, done some of those things on our own. But let's see how we can bring certain things at least back. Start off with our containers. One thing I know is that we'll need to keep our implicit sharing. It's been you know, used throughout um, too much and um, the performance, different performance characteristics uh, and memory characteristics of unshared containers would probably silently break a lot of our users' neck if we just changed that. So it would break too much user code and in a way that it wouldn't be detectable even at compile time. So we'll need to keep that, but how can we align them better with standard C++? First thing, of course, is to provide a compatible API on top of whatever we have in, in, in the Qt, uh, Qt specific, something we have been doing already to a large extent, but I think we're not, we're not perfect there. I also th am considering implementing some of the, our containers in terms of the standard ones, you know, QMAP, QSET, and QHash. Well, why aren't we using a, a standard hash map, for example, as the implementation? It's an implementation detail, and then you know, add the ref count um, for, for the implicit sharing. And you know, we should have something that's very compatible and where you can actually convert you know, through move operators without you know, having to you know, copy the data back and forth. QVector, I'm not quite sure whether we want to keep our own implementation or not. That's something that still needs to be decided. And some others we can simply very, do very simple through a using directive. QPair is actually you know, API compatible with standard pair. There's no reason why they should be different in Qt 6 anymore. As I said, for me, there's also a question is, how can we do and can we do zero copy, uh, zero copy conversion between Qt and standard containers? Basically, through move operators, have a move constructor from the standard container and have a, have a conversion that basically converts it and takes, takes it out, basically resets the Qt container to, to an empty one. That's interesting from you know, most of the other types that are not already, you know, will not be based on standard containers. If they're based on standard containers, that, that problem is solved. No problem, we can do it. If we're not basing them on standard containers, then we'll have to see, can we get the data out um, and put it, stuff it into a standard container without having to basically copy the data. Another critique point has often been QList. Um, QList is, is a difficult class. It has a problematic runtime behavior because it depends very much on 
certain conditions on your object. How big is your object? If it's larger than a pointer, suddenly the runtime behavior is very, very different from if that's smaller or equals to a pointer. Because we would allocate new everyone on the heap, every item there implicitly. But it had some optimizations like being able to prepend in a loop and not get quadratic behavior. What we're planning there is actually to you know, merge the two classes, fully align the APIs now within Qt 5.13, and then you know, in Qt 6, probably QVector will be the class that's left, and QList becomes an alias to it. Uh, so it might give some smaller changes in runtime behavior. As I said, I mean, what's getting worse is uh, if you have a really, really large item inside that QList, or if you prepend in a loop. Uh, but in, you know, from the measurements I've done so far, in 90% of the cases, we'll get quite a bit of performance improvements actually out of it. And if you have very large objects, you anyway should use a pointer to the, to the object uh, inside the container. Um, we have a new Q-Vector implementation already written by Tiago Masiera. Um, let's see, that has quite a bit of performance impro improved performance. Layout-wise, it's very similar to standard, standard vector but it adds the, the ref count, the implicitly shared ref count. And my question currently is, can we get a zero copy conversion to standard vector? You know, can we get move, get move operators between standard vector and Q vector? I'm not sure about that one yet. We'll have to see. But we can certainly get the API compatibility. And we could get the cop zero copy conversion actually if we have a you know, non-standard um, memory allocator for standard vector. But of course, most people want to use standard vector just with a default memory allocator. And then things get a little bit more tricky. In terms of string handling, um, with Qt5, actually, we started a process where we said, you know, we want to move towards, more towards Unicode uh, UTF-8 um, for everything we're doing. We were a little bit limited there. We didn't manage to get everything done in time. Um, so, but with Qt6, I want to really finish that off, say that all 8-bit data that we get is assumed to be UTF-8. If you convert it to a Q-string or use it for text handling, the default encoding that we're supporting in, in Qt Core is limited to those two, and maybe UTF-32, let's see. Probably that one as well. Um, we w I want to assume that you t our source code files are encoded in UTF-8. So if you have source code somewhere and you have strings in there, let's, let's assume they're UTF-8. Something we couldn't do for Qt5 because it wasn't so, we, you we couldn't force Micro Visual Studio to accept UTF-8 as the input encoding. Other than you know, extend our use of QString view, the equivalent to standard string view, uh, and use it consistently in our API whenever we have a string that we take in and take ownership over, create a copy, then you know, we probably want to have a Q-string view as the o overload. And the text conversion stuff that we have you know, to convert from legacy encodings, we'll move that out into a separate library. If you need it, it's there, but uh, you'll have to basically use it from outside. And then there are some other ideas. Um, one of them that I really want to see whether we can do is expose more of the Qt quick functionality you know, to, to C++. As you know, I mean, with QML, Qt Quick, you have to write most many things in QML. Can we bring some of the concepts over to C++, like the concept of bindings, you know, where you have a property and you bind it to a certain expression and we will make, you know, Qt ensures that the binding always stays up to date. Can we bring that over and have a C++ API to, for, for that? And how does it look? You know, how can we make that actually easy to use? And hopefully also have some, you know, expose a C++ API for Qt Quick items much more than we do now in Qt 5. We'll have to, you know, we want to do changes to the type system. You know, we have currently QMeta type, which is some of the magic behind also the signal slot mechanism and, and other things. I uh, want to make that more flexible, unified with uh, the code that we have currently duplicated between meta type and QVariant. And the type ID will probably not become, be an integer anymore as we have today, but become, become a pointer to a compile time struct so that we have that information, more of that information you know, generated and available from, from the start that we don't need to register things at one time. And we'll probably also need to look into a new architecture for QIO device. That one has been 90% you know, unchanged since Qt 1, 2 times, long, a long time. And uh, 
it is really ripe for re-architecturing and see how we can fix certain perform performance bottlenecks in there, whether we can allow, allow chaining you know, I.O. devices together, like you have an I.O. device that operates on a file or on, on a socket for the network, and you chain it to a, something that does uncompression and so on. Let's have a look. We don't know yet how that will look. Um, if this is very much up in the open. Another big area where we need to do changes is actually um, on the graphics side. Um, we have been, um, you know, for Qt5 assuming that our cross-platform graphics API is, is actually OpenGL. Unfortunately, that doesn't really work any do anymore today. You know, Vulkan has entered the stage. Um, Apple is, is pushing for Metal has even deprecated OpenGL now in, in the latest versions of iOS and macOS. We have DirectX on Windows, and actually the, op, you know, the, the OpenGL driver problem on Windows was never really solved. Using it with Angle was sort of quirky. So we need a proper solution for that one. And the idea that we currently have, and it's, uh, that we have been working on, is to have a graphics abstraction layer um, on top of those, where we encapsulate you know, the most important pieces, the pieces that we need for Qt in a cross-platform way. Hopefully also expose that then at some point as a public API towards our users so that they can work also in, in a graphics API independent way. And, you know, have in there things like, you know, materials, meshes, um, lights, and these kind of things, all the things that you, you need for 3D, you know, to, to build up 3D on top of it. And then, you know, build up our scene graph for Qt QML and for Q, uh, Qt 3D on top of that lay abstraction layer. Finally, we also need to unify things for 2D and 3D. Um, currently, um, you know, Qt Quick as the 2D user interface technology and Qt 3D, they use two separate scene graphs um, that are not really shared. Um, and if you want to use both of them together, you pay a penalty because we need to render one of the two in a, into an off-screen surface, blit it in. Uh, it's not ideal. And, you know, we want to have a unified scene graph for those things so that we can, they can work together. We can get the optimal performance out of that in all use cases. Share graphics assets. Share things like also, you know, if you, have, um, if you want to do a, some sort of animations and timelines, that you can use those together. And... <coughs> and have then some flexible C++ and QML-based APIs on top of that. Of course, also then looking into new things like AR, VR use cases, make sure that we support those. And then, you know, I've been talking, finally, I've been talking about um, that we have two, two solutions for user interface designers. We have Qt3D Studio and Qt Design Studio. And if you listen just to what I just said, you, you know, might figure out that this is actually not ideal neither. Why do we have two solutions? Well, it's historical reasons. This is how things came together. You can use them together, but they're separate applications. They don't quite work together. Uh, you know, they're not the same thing. And that's something we need to solve as well in that course. If we have one unified stack for the graphics, one scene graph, there's no reason we should have two tools. So finally, final it work item for that, and maybe we'll be able to do a, some of those things already before Qt 6.0 comes out, is that we need a unified design tool for, for 2D and 3D user interfaces. That's also something we're working on. So moving forward, a lot of that work will start you know, for full actually after Christmas. That's when we, I expect that we'll create a, a branch you know, inside our repositories for Qt 6, probably called Next. Oh, let's see. And start working on some of those changes, some of them People already have patches for some of those things, but it, you know, it's, it's then after probably in a, in a month or two from now that we'll have that, our repository available and start pushing those patches into a next branch. Idea is also that whatever we have that can easily go into the Qt5 series will still go into the 5 series, but you know, the next, we will also keep our release schedule for Qt5, so every six months a new feature release. But as more and more of the work will shift towards Qt6, I would expect that those you know, releases 5.13, 5.14, 5.15 will probably not has, have quite as many new features as we had in the Qt5 series so far. 
Yes, and I think that concludes it. With that, I'd like to thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, the performance increases you mentioned in QML, will they enable uh, the QML to run more performant on iOS devices without uh, having to have it uh, uh, pre-compiled, as was the case earlier? So meaning that I, uh, I could stream uh, QML over and have yep. the uh, interface uh, updated based on something I loaded mm -hmm. on the web and allow it to be in an app that the App Store sells? Yes. Um, yeah, so just for, for some, for, as an explanation for people, the problem on iOS is that we can't JIT. So we, you know, we have to run with a bytecode interpreter because uh, jitting and basically iOS doesn't allow that. Um, yes, but the answer is yes, we have some pretty significant performance improvements on, especially on the bytecode interpreter. That one is actually should be in 5.12 almost twice as fast as it was in 5.9. Yeah. Thank you. It's so, you know, hopefully that helps. Hi, uh, I'd like to say that uh, the company that I work for, we basically just managed to update to 5.9 and we're looking forward to 5.12 which is a really really good place to be right now for us um, so you mentioned source code compatibility not breaking it and one of the very interesting things the themes that are coming out are uh, having automated uh, tool, tools that automate mm -hmm. this sort of conversion so why not break source code compatibility, but if someone proposes a, yes. a break, they must also provide the tool that upgrades the code. Right. As much as that's possible, you know, if I have a tool that can do the conversion, I don't really consider that a source code break in that respect. So for me, that's as, those cases are probably something we can be fine if we have that tool and it actually works reliably, you know, you basically make it maybe working on, you know, from the Clang tool sets out or, you know, being built on top of lib Clang. Um, that is actually fine for me. The thing is that you can't, not everything can be handled that way. There are many cases where, you know, you would break source compatibility in a, in a let's say, more subtle way than just, you know, that's then something that's solvable by renaming one, one function to another or, or something like that. I mean, you can also do larger conversions, but I would assume that uh, we can't handle everything automatically, and those we want to avoid. But I mean, as I said, I mean, I'm not giving 100% guarantees that it'll be 100% source code compatible between five, Qt 5, let's say 15, or, and, and Qt 6. Okay, uh, one last thing. Uh, always in the tools uh, uh, part. The, one of the pain points that uh, we are seeing uh, right now are we want to be good, we want to uh, move our Qt compatibility stuff forward. I tried to download Clazy uh, on my Mac mm -hmm. and it's a pain. I mean, you have to get brew and then compile oh. Clang and then do thing, do that. Get, it, the, get the latest creator that's coming out now. Uh, you can get the beta already now. Mm -hmm. That one has Clazy support built in. Thank you. I hope that solves the problem. Hey, yeah. uh, thanks for the talk. Um, it's great to see that there is more convergence towards the standard C++ going on. Um, which standard do you target right now with Qt, and is that going to change for Qt 6? Yes, that's going to change. Currently, we, currently we support, C, um, well, basically, you can use whatever you want in your project. But we have set a limit, our limit minimum version is C++11 right now. Actually, um, baseline currently is, I think with 5.12, um, uh, before it was Visual Studio 2013, which was defining the baseline. I think we dropped that one with 5.12, so it should be 2015 now, now defining the baseline. But, and we have actually, on the embedded side, we have some older, we have to deal with some crappy compilers, let's put it this way, uh, for certain embedded versions. I mean, integrity, the compiler is not, you know, 100% where we would like it to be sometimes or in some other cases. 
Right. And do you still have this meta object compiler, or will yes. you be pure C++ okay. uh, at so, some point? So first of all, the, the other question for you was, what are we going to do for Qt 6? Current idea is that C++ 17 will be the minimum version that we require. Maybe, let's see how fast the compiler vendors can provide something, um, we will actually go beyond that. Um, so my idea is that we, for Qt 6, first release, we take the, you know, basically the most up-to-date version of Visual Studio, Clang, and GCC, and whatever is the common subset of those three we can use. All right, that, that's good to hear. So we might even see some, like, newer features uh, being used. Like, are there, like, thoughts on um, concepts, ranges, these kind those of things? thoughts, so far only thoughts, and, uh, you know, we'll have to figure out where they make sense to be, uh, where it makes sense to use them, right? Um, if, but the question is, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, we can't start that work really before we have, you know, a baseline of all three compilers supporting them. And that's, that's that. On the mock, the meta object compiler, no, we won't get rid of that one. The problem is, I mean, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, before we have meta classes or something similar, in the C++ standard, we can't really get rid of it. Um, we need dynamic introspection at one time. And for that, we need to generate the appropriate data structures. And, you know, anything else than the mock is very hard to do that. But on the other hand, you never see that one really because it's, you know, both, you know, QMake, CMake supported very nicely out of the box. And, you know, you don't really have to worry about that one, that thing for you. It's just a, you know, it's just a code generator. Thanks. Yes, welcome. More questions? Uh, is there any thoughts on how long you're going to be staying with QMake as a primary build system? Or are you going to be moving over to CMake or something else? So, okay, uh, that goes to the build system discussion. We had lively discussions around that one on the mailing list lately. But um, Qt 6 will be, ba the current plan is to base the build system on CMake for Qt itself. We will support both QMake and CMake as build systems um, for a long time. So we want to work, make sure that we actually support CMake much better than we did in the past. But QMake, you know, is there. It's used by a large amount of our users. And so that one will not go away during the Qt 6 lifetime. Thank you. Thanks. More questions? Oh, There's one. Sorry. Yeah, uh, one question more. Uh, you talked about... Uh, Uh, Qt4 Python. Yes. Mm, from uh, from the slides, I, I see that uh, you bring uh, classes like you labels uh, and and so on. Uh, you bring also some compatibility with C++ and uh, connection between uh, C++ uh, classes and Python yes. scripts. There is currently. I mean, it's okay. So in the current version of Qt for Python, we don't officially support that, but there are tools there, for example, that you can use to take your own classes and basically expose those to Python as well. It's called a tool called Shiboken, and with that one you can basically generate the required wrappers that you need uh, and the required bindings. So there's a binding generator that's there. Um, in the first version it's not yet officially supported, but the longer term plan is to also have that officially supported. But you know, if you need it, go ahead and use it, but it's at, on, at your own risk and you know, you'll have to take care of, of things yourself. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the uh, for response. Sure. Uh, my question is regarding licensing. Uh, can commercial uh, software use Qt open source uh, libraries without no worries? I mean, that mm. their source code can be revealed. Because actually, in my previous company, we where we had a commercial software, we used the open source version of Qt libraries without, it seems like without no worries, our legal department uh, was verified it. But in Alteryx, the company that I worked right now, uh, actually legal dep department told that uh, open source license can have some uh, issues or like if somebody can can be able to integrate a new version of Qt, they may ask uh, a company to reveal their source code, which is yes. closed. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give you, a, you know, first of all, the disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. Um, just to make that very clear, so, you know, don't take anything that I'm saying as legal advice, ask your lawyers as well. Qt is currently licensed under mainly two licenses, LGPL version 3 and GPL version 3 for certain parts. So the tooling and certain frameworks are also licensed under GPL. 
if you're using you know anything that's GPL licensed, you most likely need to open uh, open source, uh, or you actually need to open source whatever you have um, if you basically sell that product, start selling that product. <coughs> LGPL v3 is a little less restrictive, and you know the core components un are under that license. You can use it to do commercial applications. Uh, but you cannot use it to create lockdown embedded devices. So, and the, the thinking behind this is actually that, um, that what, we, what we want to achieve is you know, that Qt is in a way you know, free software, as in not as in free beer, but in you know, the, the GNU meaning, meaning you know, free, uh, free to use if you give something back. What we want is that you know, if you create something using Qt, that you somehow give something back. Ideally, so if you create a lockdown embedded device, you know you have to open up that device for people to for hacking and tinkering. So you're giving something back to the Qt developer community; they can actually tinker with that device. If you create a lockdown device, you know, like you know, medical space or others who have actually probably don't want to do that, you know, then you know you give something back. If, if you if you buy a license from the Qt company and you know that with that fund the development, you know, of Qt, you know, to come. I mean, we have a team of. Inside the cute company, 120 full-time uh, people in the R&D organization, and somebody needs to pay that bill. So, you know, we want to we have that dual licensing model, and I think it works pretty nicely. Um, I'm I'm personally a big fan of open source. I love open source, but you know, I also want to see that we you know can somehow continue developing Qt forward and keeping it relevant, because without that, it would not be relevant in in a couple of years from now. Okay, well, with that, I'd like to thank you, everybody. And um, one more thing, there's a cute meetup directly after this one here in, I think, room E. Um, so if you have further questions or something like that, I'll be there, and we'll have a couple of other cute, cute people there. So come there, you know, we can have a chat uh, about anything that you want uh, in a more informal session. Thank you very much.